Next up is Jeremy Leggett. Um, many of you will know him. He is uh, a, arguably um, the most successful UK clean energy entrepreneur. Um, he has done battle with incumbents for many, many years. Um, he is also uh, the chairman of um, the Carbon Tracker Initiative, which um, David Blood referred to earlier. So um, really an interesting voice from the entrepreneurial perspective. Over to you. Well, thank you, Colin. Um, the brief I've been given this afternoon is to give you a perspective from the entrepreneurial world um, based on 12 years of experience. My forward button doesn't seem to be working. Ah, okay. And to be honest about how it feels um, doing an appraisal of the system in which we operate, having been on some kind of a frontier in clean tech for this period of time. So um, I set Solar Century up because of the problems of climate change and fossil fuel dependency as a sort of hoping to create a, a talisman for what, what could be done. And it's very clear that if we're to get off this oil dependent road that we're on and the fact that we're locked into a six degree world through current fossil fuel dependency, even with large amounts of industrial scale carbon capture and storage, we really need amazing companies to emerge in clean energy. They have to be right across the full family of renewables. There are no magic bullets. I think most people agree with this. Uh, and it has to span all of renewable heating, electricity, and of course, motive power as well. We have to create, if you like, new Microsofts, new Googles, um, and we have to do them in numbers and fast. Problem is, we're now probably 15 years, decade and a half into this search. And where are they? As venture capitalists know, in increasing numbers to their increasing cost, they haven't emerged yet. We haven't been able to recreate um, with all the capital that's gone into the clean tech industry, the kind of phenomenon we had with the digital revolution and with the internet revolution. Now, I have lived through this for 12 years and frankly speaking, come to the state of mind where I think there's something really very malign going on that we have to address systemically. But our organizers asked me to sort of tell you, those people who don't know me, where I'm coming from so you can get some sort of perspective on what follows. Solar Century um, has been luckier than many of its peers in the solar business. Uh, lucky break number one, we raised our first venture capital in the same month of the 21st century's first crash, the dot-com crash. Had we done it slightly later, uh, we, we, well, we wouldn't have been able to do it slightly later. And so in the withering recession that followed that, we made our way across the valley of death far too slowly, but eventually emerged out to profitability in our sixth year, having had a number of near-death experiences, as you can imagine, en route. Um, but by that time, we had our own products, solar electric roof tiles, and we'd completed what we thought then, I think now, um, was the biggest variety of building integrated and building attached solar, actually of any company in the world. We'd also got well on our way to what was to be the first of four intra-company marriages. So <laughs> in the event that um, we ultimately join many of our colleagues in bankruptcy, hey, at least we'll have succeeded as a dating agency. <laughs> We also set up our first, well, our charity, Solar Aid, with 5% of our profits. That's what we'd always intended to do. And that's now a thriving entity, um, having established a for-profit subsidiary of its own. So into year seven, uh, we raised more money, this time from Silicon Valley. Uh, so we were able to greatly strengthen our leadership team, broaden our product range, go international, fly business class. No, that's a joke, at the expense of my chief finance officer. And then, of course, we get to year eight. Uh, and year eight was the year of the credit crunch. Uh, and in that year, in the same month that the bank stopped lending, August, 
we raised 13 and a half million pounds. Lucky break number two. If we hadn't done that, we would be bankrupt now, like so many of the people that we'd started out with. And it would have been the bankers who would have done it to us as they did it to so many companies that could have been helping out in this um, process of trying to find survival clean tech technologies. So instead, we were able to go through our second ascent to profitability. And now today, um, even with the, the thin margins that our industry has, we have more money in the bank than we raised in the fourth round. We've value engineered the roofing products, so we've kept pace with the market, kept competitive in a number of countries. We've um, introduced a range of sort of roofing products, which are also competitive. And uh, we've outsourced the supply chain to China to squeeze out yet more cost and established an R&D center that's a sort of magnet for talent in design and value engineering that controls all this. We've, we've also done a few ground mount systems, not too many that we stress the cash flow, but enough to lift the top line. And so for companies like this, what does the future hold? Well, if you can be a survivor, it could be very rosy indeed. Some of you will know this report by McKinsey that came out a couple of weeks ago uh, that says that by 2020, just eight years from now, there will be a thousand gigawatts of economic solar around the world, a thousand gigawatts. Now, um, that's a lot. And as McKinsey says, that will change the face of the energy industry in a relatively short period of time. And the driver of that, of course, is the systemic cost down that's happening in the industry. Whatever happens to price, this green curve conceptually descending is what you see. Um, conventional energy costs, meanwhile, are going up on the whole all the time. And these two lines will cross over in multiple markets in just a few years. In fact, in some markets already have. So this will usher in some kind of a revolution. And of course, it will be backed up by a theme we've heard a lot about uh, from different speakers already today. Uh, and that is the mobilization of the vast sums of money that we, the people, ultimately own in the pension funds in the form of green bonds, in the form of ESCO-related financial uh, models, and this will accelerate the whole virtuous circle. So for a company like Solar Century, all things being equal, um, you know, the, rosy, the, the future could look quite rosy. Now, for all our investors, like so many others in clean tech, we've been a failure and a disappointment, but um, compared to our peers, we've been something of a success story, in at least we're still alive. So as I look at all this, what, do, what does it feel like? I've got to tell you, I, I, I am pretty gloomy. There are, there are a lot of people like me who have this gloomy view. I think the system is broken, and it needs root-to-branch reform. That's my experience of it. Uh, and let me explain why I think that. I mean, item number one, of course, the system itself has come close to self-destruction in recent years and may yet do so. We all know this. We read the Financial Times every day. We study what's happening with the euro and everything else. And we have lived with this for these years since 2008 and the crash um, every day of our working lives. And you just have to imagine the impact on our main client area, the construction industry. You know, we focus on building integrated, building attached solar. Uh, that's just where it starts. But then there's also been the incumbency. And here, you know, Justin and I will agree on many things, but I do think there is a fundamental, if you like, um, confrontation, if not conflict issue here. The way I have experienced the big energy incumbency is as a quasi-institutionalized human culture that has a massive default defense mechanism that is very, very disruptive of the technologies and industries trying to come through. There's no escaping this. And um, there are three sets of actors. I mean, the leaders of this industry, thankfully some, not all, are dead set on keeping us locked into the big things, nuclear and or gas. That's how they stop their customer base going to the decentralized um, community-based energy, self-reliant energy, that renewables can so foster. Some, though thankfully not all, have the bankrollers of the whole system. Big capital, conventional capital, tends to 
prefer big energy, among other things, the bonuses come easier. Just look at all the investment banks uh, underpinning Glencore there. Then there's the quasi-institutionalized um, supporters in public service. And again, generalizing, this is many, perhaps most, but certainly not all, thankfully, who um, actually, you know, like the idea that big energy is called centralized, it's centralized power, and that operates at both the literal and the metaphorical levels. So we've had to deal with that in a lot of guises as well, and still do. And as we look at the system, I mean, it's not controversial to say any longer that it's in crisis, even the FT acknowledges that, but um, growing numbers of us do think it's completely broken. And I would put next in my list of concerns, it seems to me as time goes by, it's actually blind to potentially existential threats. And I uh, would include a couple of the things that I personally work on here. Over the recent years, I've worked on climate change, um, on oil depletion, and with my colleagues at Carbon Tracker on the way that we do carbon accounting on balance sheets and on stock exchanges. So just a few words on each of those very quickly. Climate change, you know, surely this is the litmus test for the functionality of a system. If your, your system is unable to do anything other than keep you on course, for a six degree world, what does that tell you about your system? That's what we have to deal with. If your system is in very large measure blind to depletion to the extent of discounting the risk of premature peak oil, when you know, growing numbers of authoritative peop uh, uh, commentators are saying this is a problem that could hit the system, an oil dependent global economy within just a few years, what does that tell you about your system? If your system allows you to keep on clocking carbon assets as assets at zero risk of impairment on the balance sheets of energy companies and on stock exchanges, despite the fact your climate community is telling you that if you burn just around 20% of global proved reserves, never mind what they're looking for, then um, you, know, you undermine the climate system, go above two degrees Celsius. What does that tell you about your system? I think, you know, I've come to the conclusion it tells you your system is dysfunctional to the point of being uh, probably a bit suicidal. Then there's the short-termism we've heard about already today, um, and that is sometimes so grotesque that cartoonists lampoon it with vitriol in national newspapers. Now, some of you will find that cartoon offensive, um, but don't shoot the messenger. You know, this is the zeitgeist. I, too, have a pinstripe suit. Um, but this is the kind of thing we're, we're seeing uh, routinely. And this short-termism I experience as an entrepreneur on a daily, if not weekly, basis. And one of the things I really worry about is that we've been missing out, and David Blood talked about this um, indirectly, uh, that we've been missing out on potential breakthrough innovations simply because of the gestation period that our investors are forced to focus us on um, is just so short. Then final thought is the, the, the way that the incumbency is allowed to deploy its PR budget in a civilized society. These big energy companies, um, of course, have multi-million pound budgets. And those of us who know people in the PR industry know how they deploy them below the radar. So they are routinely able to trans transform every occasional malfunctioning wind turbine into national news headlines in the, in the tabloids. Uh, and they routinely prosecute the, the notion that, you know, the reason your energy bills are going up is because of green measures, not because of the wholesale price of gas or any other thing. Uh, and this, given the stakes that we're dealing with, is something um, in a civilized society that really surely should be too poisonous to tolerate. And yet, not only do we tolerate it, but it goes on and on, so that every new oil field discovery means the death of peak oil, every big exploration program in fracked gas that comes in, you know, gives us another Qatar in gas that we can expect. Um, every injudicious email by a climate scientist gets whipped up into a faux Watergate capable of derailing an entire climate summit. This is dysfunctional to the point of being suicidal, and yet it's the norm. 
So just to finish then, where, where do I think it's going to go, um, given these um, lessons that I, I feel I've learned during the 12 years on the frontier? I, I do think there will be a re-engineering of modern capitalism. I think it will be forced on us because uh, I fear, I hope I'm wrong, but I fear what we're going to get is another shock to the system. And it could come from the innate um, foibles of the financial system, the way that the aftermath of the credit crunch and the financial crash are playing through in this great credit bubble that modern capitalism has allowed to accumulate around the world. Or it could come from a resource depletion shock such as the one that the UK industry task force on peak oil uh, fears. In any event, it won't probably be amenable to uh, bail out in the way that um, the last crisis was. And I don't think that the people are going to allow the political class to get away without a fundamental system of reform this time round either. And you can see that the way communities are beginning to prepare themselves for this kind of thing, the local energy uh, projects like Wade, Wade, Wade Bridge will be only accelerated by, by the sort of pressures that will come from the crash. So we have it within us, um, I agree with David Blood on this, to get to um, a formulation that can offer sanity and survival. But uh, we're going to be very hard pressed. We will have to find ways of mobilizing uh, pension fund money at scale to do that. If we do do it, what we then have in prospect beyond you know, what undoubtedly is going to be a terrain where things get better before they get, get worse before they get better. What we then bring into focus is the possibility of a renaissance beyond based on the innate, the intrinsic uh, differences between renewable te uh, technologies and um, the conventional technologies. That I think we can do. Will we do it? I don't know. But we certainly have to find out if we can do it and we have to try. Thank you very much for listening to me.